China's Uyghur genocide sanitized. That's my title. That's my headline that I'm going with. Now, there is a different way to interpret this, and we're going to get to that in a moment here. But first, let's uh, let's uh, let's clear the way for you. Have a seat here. Welcome, welcome to the news bar. Here, I am. Uh, I am Frico. I'm here to talk the news from the news bar. Give her this little title here, and uh, let's uh, let's talk about our story today, which is going to be well, their title. A little bit different than my title, and their title is coming from China.org.cn. Uh, this is a Chinese state-approved run website. <clears throat> Xianjiang farmers, herders benefit from relocation program. Bultitik. Bultijan Bekari is satisfied with his life now, which features a well-equipped house and stable jobs for him and his wife. Six years ago, the poverty-stricken family lived in a shabby house in Surat's village of Kwapaljib Autonomous County, Zhangjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. As the village was tucked away deep in the mountainous area, the couple could hardly make ends meet in the barren grasslands and as, as livestock herders. In 2014, amid the efforts to alleviate poverty, the country, the county started to relocate the village of 233 households, including 164 poor ones, from the remote area to the newly built Uzunborak residential area in the county. Paved roads, tap water, schools and health centers. The county has invested more than 72 million yen. And uh, for our English readers, that's about 10.5 million U.S. dollars. Wow, that's not a lot of money. Over the past six years, wow, over six years, that's a, not even a lot of money at all. In building the new resettlement site into a place with better living conditions and villagers for villagers. I wonder where they get their labor from. Life has undergone a tremendous change after relocation, said 56-year-old Budijan Bakari. We, are, we now have access to health centers, schools, and kindergartens, the 56-year-old said. Kindergartens. Besides improved infrastructure and adequate medical and education resources. Wow, education resources. Yay. Yay. Get to choose what our kids get to... No. No. No, no. They're going to be Chinese. They're going to be Han Chinese. They're going to marry Han Chinese people. And your way is dead. The Uyghur way is no more. <clears throat> they will unlearn the Uyghur language if they know it, and if they don't know it, they won't learn it. And they're going to learn the Han Chinese way, and they're going to think Han Chinese, and they're going to even think they're Han Chinese, and they're going to be absorbed. The Borg will absorb. And the dissenters? Well, we'll go through uh, uh, from education resources to edu re-education <clears throat> centers. We have brought in agricultural product processing factories, established agricultural cooperatives, and organized technical training for them, ensuring they could prosper in their new homes. After relocation, uh, Burjan Bakari, the former herder, opened a mutton shop and a barbecue stall at a local market. He is also one of the chefs of a restaurant in the village. Probably also an informant. Probably like, uh, I believe, in the in the the Jewish resistance, at least in the, in, in the Hitler times, referred to the people who turned on themselves, turned themselves in, and also kind of were willing to serve in management roles to help, uh, help, uh, help the Jews on the cattle cars. They were called capos. And uh, maybe that's what we're looking at, kind of a uh, vibe there. There uh, could be what we're talking about. Uh, look at that. We have brought in agriculture. See that Bawudayan party chief of Uzunborak. Yeah, now they got a party chief. See, they bring they bring the Uyghurs out. They disperse them to different parts of China against their will. Believe you me, these people ain't signing up. I mean, I'm sure there are. There's always a few people probably that would have left of their own accord if you had, if it was a voluntary type of thing. But uh, 
Uh, there's plenty of Uyghurs that wanted to stay right where they were. Also wanted to continue the lives that uh, for for what you call poverty. Like, okay, it's not poverty if I don't need money. It's like, okay, I don't have money. Yeah, but I don't need money. It's not poverty. But that's their never mind. Uh, and then they're resettling them. And this is how we begin our story. This is the beginning of our tale. But we move on. This is from August 2013. We're going back in time. China death toll in Jiang police shootout climbs as exile group blasts raid. <sighs> See, this is what authoritarians, authoritarians, it says authorities, but it's really authoritarians. This is from, from roughworld.org. I don't know anything about this site. Okay, UN Refuge Agency. Okay, so it's, it's going to be pro-China because China has... They pretty much own most of the administration and most of the world type of... I won't say own, but I'll say they have a... If not a majority influence, they usually have a at least a plurality influence uh, in terms of the administrators on the back end uh, because they're willing to pay people off. <laughs> Authorities in China's yen yen... I mean, we're all willing to pay people off. It's just the Chinese are a whole other level. Authorities in China's Xinjiang region said Tuesday that they have shot dead 22 Uyghurs accused of terrorism last week, by the way. You know, I remember when, uh, when uh, 2003, 2001 to 2003, everybody was a terrorist and terrorist. And I was like, terrorist, 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 terrorist. You know, one man's terrorist, another man's bread butter. It's like, that's just a commie. Now I understand. Now I understand. So uh, I mean, understood way before this, but. I understand full well that uh, the use of the word terrorist and embracing the term terrorist, not such a great idea in my humble opinion. But anyway, uh, revising and an higher an initial death toll in one of the biggest crackdowns on the ethnic minority Muslim group. They said they have also arrested four Uyghurs in a ra- Muslim. It's not really about their Muslim. It's about their 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 non Han in a land that the Chinese want to expand Han into. It's uh yeah, it's it's a uh, it's it's this 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 uh, whole uh now the Chinese they, they did this before Hitler, mind you, but the whole Hitler Liebenstrom thing, it's the notion that the, the people that the the people need a certain amount of land for the people to be the greatness of the people and and this this Uyghur land is is is, is needed Han land in terms of the uh, 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 uh of this uh this uh, convenient little standard that uh, really uh, the Chinese uh, uh, had been uh, mastering and, and crafting for thousands of years, a couple, well, a couple thousand years at least before, before the 20th century. So we're going to move forward. That's just a little bit of taste. And here's China. There's China. Now, the, uh, the Uyghur Uyghur, this is Yun Zhang. Notice how that gets its own. It's supposed to be autonomous, and China needs it. They're, they're discovering there's stuff in Yun Zhang that's very useful, and there's space that they need, and yeah, China needs to take a lot of these Han Chinese all trapped up in here and congest and you know, move them on out, move them on out, move them into these mountains and, and pacify the land by moving... And they take all the Uyghurs and they move them all out, like in all kinds of places. Like, uh, and they want them to lose their identity. That's the idea. They just get absorbed into the Han Chinese mind melt. <clears throat> That's the general idea. China. This is what we're talking about. The People's Republic of China is a county, a country in East Asia. It's the world's most populous country. One point four billion. It's the world's third or fourth country. I, I, I you know, that's a, I, I, no, never mind. And then let's hear, let's, let's play their, their, their national anthem is called March of the Volunteers. There's, there's nothing voluntary about the, I mean, all nation states are coercive by their nature, but there are degrees of coercion. I'll say the Chinese nation state is a very, very high level coercive enterprise type state, very, a high level of central control compared to most nation states, even certainly compared to the United States. Arise. 
all ye who wish not to be slaves, with our sweat and blood, let us build a great new wall. I was trying to face the greatest peril. Okay. Now, by the way, you'll notice, like, I don't care as much as I do not like Chairman Z and the uh, common Chinese Communist Party. I do not respect the nation state's uh, anthem because I understand how, uh, I mean, I think anthems in general are stupid, but uh, I respect uh, human beings' uh, emotional attachment to their anthems, so I don't I don't make fun of anthems. Nope, won't do it. So that's our little uh, background there, China. And then we get this little uh, jewel here, Newt Gingrich. This is... Uh, now things are stirring up as we're looking at what's going on in China today. New Gingrich, China infiltrates U.S. Hunter Biden. Other examples show extent of pro pro problem. Now this is there's this is the hyperbolic right. So the degree to a, the veracity of his statements, I'm not going to state on that, and I'm not going to play the New Gingrich thing. I'm just noting the uh, uh, the headline here, but. Uh, uh, the, the, the of note here is that remember that all Chinese companies by law are subordinate to the communist dictatorship. True. And Kelly's relationship with Tencent is really a relationship with the dictatorship. Absolutely right. So Kelly's business part. So, so how are we? How are, okay. So Hunter Biden's massively profitable ties with the communist Chinese have become bigger and bigger national issue. These two stories are part of a growing tide of, of examples of the Chinese communist dictatorship's efforts to infiltrate and influence America. CNBC reported that 33-year-old Tibetan-born New York police officer and U.S. Army Reservist uh, Baima Daiji and Wang was arrested Monday for allegedly spying on fellow ethnic Tibetans while acting as an illegal agent for China. China. Charges allege that reports of the activities of other native Tibetans in the New York area to the Chinese consulate there. Okay, so I'm not going to go through all these, but there's... Uh, I'm not sure they've... Uh, okay, so, so similarly, selling the giant Chinese conglomerate Tencent a role in Kelly's surveillance balloon company. Okay, so Arizona U.S. Senate candidate Mark Kelly's activities with the Chinese Communist dictatorship have become an issue in that state's senatorial election. Hunter Biden's acceptance of money from allies in China, Russia, and Ukraine has become an issue. Okay, so... Kelly is nothing. I am only interested in Hunter Biden. I don't really give a, a piddle poddle about uh, Hunter Biden. So you got nothing to offer there. I don't know if he did anything. That's what, that wasn't good. That wasn't good. What happens when China leads the world? The policies and practices of the country's dynasties offer insights into how modern Chinese leaders may wield their strength. This is from The Atlantic. This is written by Michael Schumann. Let's get a little tense sense of Michael Schumann's. Why America is afraid of TikTok. Why China wants Trump to win. <laughs> Don't believe the China hype. <laughs> when it comes to assessing Chinese power, things aren't always what they seem. China has dominated the West before. Angering China can now get you fired. Hong Kong shows the flaws in China's the discord of the U.S. stance against China. <laughs> Trump's trade war with China is already changing the world. Interesting. Interesting. So, he seems to be... Yeah. doesn't seem to be as shrilly partisan, although it doesn't seem to like China, but doesn't seem as worried about China as maybe others are. What kind of superpower will China be? That's the question of the 21st century. Okay, so China will not be a pacifist power. In address to the United Nations General Assembly, okay, he's going to talk about it. He said, oh, I'm just going to be benevolent, benevolent, benevolent. But this quaint picture of Chinese pacifism ignores the country's dynasties. The, that the country's dynasties were almost constantly at war. Sure, many of these wars were defensive, men, mainly against the panoply of invading northern tribesmen. But at the height of these powers, the emperors were quite aggressive expansionists too. The Han Dynasty and the Tang Dynasty, uh, I'll let you read the years, had armies marching from Central Asia to the Korean prince and Peninsula. The Song Dynasty fought wars with and sought territory from rival states. It just wasn't very good at it. The most acquisitive of the dynasties was the Qing, which carved up and controlled Tibet and conquered Italy's Xinjiang. Now, I do want to make note, this person, I, I'm, my understanding of Chinese history is like scratch piddles probably compared to this person. But even before all this, the, 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 the thousand years of constant wars, they... They crafted a lot, and they 
really fine-tuned so many forms of uh, coercive enterpriseism. They became the masters of it. And my theory is essentially they lived in a land that was, was and in large part thanks to, to the rice paddy fields, that was able to provide a, 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 a just a, an explosion of human beings so that they could have wars with little little generational con, con consequences they produce so many human beings they could have they could have massive wars and massive people die and they could they could produce people to keep the wars going and so it wasn't it, it was just the circumstance of the times uh, the land created the uh, well, the constant churn of churn of humans. So, so this person's take is basically: listen, China's history is such they're they're not going to be benevolent. They will insist on their own world order. Uh, they're they they will export their values. Uh, uh, they uh, one reason supporting the notion that China will be a, a, a benign superpower is the anomaly amorality of its current foreign policy unlike the u.s with its missionary zeal to bring its form of liberty to all china doesn't seem as interested in changing the world historically though the chinese believed that their culture had a transformative power it could change barbarians into civilizations confucius himself thought so and by the way chairman z is turning back to confucius so it's he that he points that out i'm sure he he probably understands that more profoundly than I do. In the Analytics, China's greatest sage expressed desire to live among barbarian tribes. A startled listener asked how he could tolerate their uncouth habits. Not to worry, Confucius answered, if a superior man dwelt among them, what rudeness would there be? So there's one take. And then there's the, uh... And then there's, uh... There's this. U.S.-China relations, mutual understanding is still possible despite the hostility. This is from Tom Plate. Getting it right between, oh, you don't have a link, darn. Or maybe you do down here. Hold on. Let's let it get, let's get a sense of what Tom Plate has to say about the world. Let's see. Ruth Bader Ginsburg's death must inspire an era of notorious renewal. China must avoid repeating Trump, U.S. history of bellicose diplomacy. How to teach China, U.S. relations as tensions between the two superpowers, superpowers soar. U.S. election. The world is waiting for Biden to beat Trump and change the course of U.S. foreign policy. This person is actually the cliche of the, uh, the Democrat uh, Chinese apologist. So there you are, Tom. U.S.-China relations, mutual understanding is still possible despite the hostility. Getting it right between China and the United States means looking for new sources of insight, not pumping more steroids into old stereotypes. There you go. This is this is the whole. They use uh, the whole rate. You can, don't don't dare uh, uh, America uh, dare challenge China because it's really just because of racism. That's kind of that. That's what they're that that that's the road that takes you down there. Old stereotypes. Despite the rapid downturn in relations, the payoff in seeking mutual understanding and rising above pre-existing notions could be priceless. The contemporary cacophony of international politics and old stereotypes interferes with the possibility of harmony. Peace overturn overtures are music to the ears of all good people, but not to haters, warmongers, or arms merchants listen to this this is a cartoon language listen to this cartoonist writing here and not a very good one all-out war in a nuclear age will be a hard act to follow it's just okay i'm not i'm done with you so so there you go and then we go on to this next little tidbit here this is uh Speaker Nancy Pelosi said Thursday that President Trump's repeated attacks on China are designed merely to divert the public's attention from potential administration mistakes in the early stages of coronavirus response. What the president is saying about that is interesting. It's an interesting diversion. Pelosi said, Hi, uh, she told some small group of reporters, blah, blah, blah. Pelosi and House Democrats are charging ahead with a massive $3 trillion legislative package. Listen to the language, by the way. Shame on this writer. Just once again, this is uh, supposed to be a straight news piece, but listen to the listen to the editorial propagandizing mike lillis puts in how he describes what the democrats are working on pelosi and house democrats are charging ahead with a massive three trillion legi three trillion dollar legislative package designed to alleviate the medical and economic damage caused by the deadly pandemic which has killed more than eighty-five thousand people in the united states and wiped out years of jobs growth 
This was written when? When was the written? When was the order written? I can't get the date on this, but this was... Okay, okay, here we go. May 14th, 2020. Duly noted. As the death toll climbs higher than the jobless numbers soar, Trump in recent weeks has increasingly blamed China where the virus is thought to have originated for doing too little to extinguish the threat and concealing the severity of the outbreak from the rest of the world. And it should have never happened. Could it? Oh, whatever. Okay. Uh, you said 500 billion if you cut off the whole relationship. Okay. That never. Okay. Pelosi dismissed the comments as bluster from a president fighting to shift political brain just months before November's election. She urged Trump and all Washington policymakers to forget about how the coronavirus arrived. Urged to forget about how the coronavirus arrived. And focus instead on how to eliminate. We should be using our energy on how we got forward uh, instead of making judgment about what administration did or didn't do. No, you're not. You're literally, literally up here. It's uh, it's an interesting diversion tool. Uh, where, where is she saying here? She said Thursday, President repeated attacks on China are designed merely to divert the public's attention from potential administrative mistake. She, she's literally calling him, saying he's made mistakes, like right away, in the same sense that she's calling him out for dare saying that China made a mistake. Now we got to go forward. She's lit. I mean, this is, okay, we're going forward. Going forward, U.S. Democratic Party foreign policy includes China criticism, international alliances. The Democratic Party's proposed platform criticizes China trade pattern practices, proposes less spending on national less spending on national defense. That's interesting, and opposes forever wars. Even though this whole time they have been the ones that have been constantly pushing Trump to go to war, war against Iran, war against Syria. You remember? Remember, they, they demanded that Trump go to war against Iran when it uh, what, 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 it hit a, a, a bomb. It, it struck an American ship, whatever that was, or struck down a or struck down an American drone. I can't remember what they did anymore. But uh, and then there was a Syria attack that they alleged uh, uh, another was it ale another alleged chemical attack, whatever it was, and and Trump. Uh, Trump didn't go to war over that, and yeah, they 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 cons and 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 they're and they he's taking troops out of Afghanistan, and they're criticizing him for that. He took troops out of Iraq. He cri These pokes are 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 literally the champions of forever wars, as it seeks to lay out the party's foreign policy goals and highlights differences with President Donald Trump. So China has become one of the central foreign policy issues in the 2020 race, heightened by President Donald Trump's trade war with the country, as well as the coronavirus pandemic, which originated there. Notice that VOA just says that, which I think pretty pretty sure it did. In their party platform, Democrats took a strong stance against China's trade policies and sought to portray Trump's, Trump's efforts against the country as not tough enough. Unlike President Trump, we will stand up to efforts from China and other state actors to steal America's intellectual property. That's what they're worried about, their intellectual property. That's what they're worried about. Not all the other crummy deals. And we'll demand China and other countries cease and desist from conducting cyber espionage against our companies. That's, that's, that's just token that's something you throw out there so you don't look like you love China. The platform also criticizes billions of criti criticizes billions of dollars of tariffs. Billions. Of, see this? They're against the tariffs. They, they didn't want any of these tariffs. In an effort to negotiate a trade deal with China, calling his trade policies reckless and saying they hurt American farmers. So they're against what he did. They're fundamentally against the moves that Trump made to try to shut down China's advantage, such as that is. And they, and they do have advantages, huge advantages. Oh, well, they did. Well, they still do, but they're losing them. This is from uh, foreignpolicy.com. This is from November 7th, 2016. Why Chinese elites endorsed Hillary Clinton. Trump's policies would be softer on China, but the global instability he'd create as president would be bad for business in Beijing. The United States, China's largest trading partner, but also its greatest geopolitical rival, rally, rival faces an election that threatens domestic instability. A Donald Trump victory would confirm to many Chinese the inherent weakness of American democracy. A Hillary Clinton victory, on the other hand, would force Beijing to deal with a political politician widely viewed as unfriendly and sometimes even hostile to Chinese interest. One might think that China would therefore welcome a Trump presidency, yet conversations over the past six months with roughly half a dozen mid-rank whatever folks 
uh, thinking uh, show that many in Chinese uh, begrudgingly support Ch Clinton precisely because they believe Trump presidency would be a disaster for the United States. Although on their face, also they're concerned about the United States stability. Isn't that nice? Although on their face, many of Trump's economic, political, and military policies would be far more beneficial to China than the Clintons. The Chinese elite seem to prefer Trump's opponent because they feel she would be better for the United States, its place in the world, and thus global stability, which remains of great importance to Beijing. Are you kidding me? This is who, who wrote this? This is like Chinese propaganda. Isaac Stonefish. Let's see what kind of crap you're writing now. Isaac Stone. There he is. There he is. That's the, this is the guy, by the way. This is the face of the you know, right. This is Foreign Policy Magazine. Look at this, this guy. I can see the softness in this man's face. This is not a man. This is a boy. This is just a little boy. Isaac Stonefish is a journalist and senior fellow at the a senior fellow. I'm sure he's a very, very wealthy young man. I'm sure from a very wealthy family, man of privilege. Why Chinese elites in Oh, he didn't. He didn't really. Uh, let's see. Oh my gosh. Okay, there he is. May 2020. Leaked Chinese virus database covers 230 cities. 640,000 database updates. The Chinese learned that Trump blinks. That's from February 11th, 10th, 2017. Let's see what this says. In a call with China's President Trump recognized, or at least nodded, at the One China policy he'd earlier questioned. On the evening of U.S. President Donald Trump had what the White House described in a terse as a screw you, screw you, screw you, screw you, screw you. So, so there you unite. I spent election night being comforted by a Chinese law professor. There you go. There you go. I mean... That's uh, why Chinese elites endorse Hillary Clinton. Because Trump will be softer on China. And China wants a stable America. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You guys taking this in? Uh, I know this video won't get any views, but at least I put this on the record. Where Hillary Clinton's China policy would differ from President Obama's. Democrat Party Presidential Front. This is from May 11, 2016. Democratic President Party Presidential Front runner Hillary Clinton is no long, no stranger to the Asia Pacific region, conducting 61 official visits during her 2009-2013 tenure as Secretary of State, as well as plenty more in her eight-year stint as First Lady. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, Clinton is generally considered to be more hawkish than Obama, and the two are said to have differed e going on key aspects of the president's policies in the Middle East. During her time as Secretary of State, Mrs. Clinton made comments with regards to China that I would consider more robust than the Obama administration's Secretary of State, John Kerry. Whatever. Or, or basically, Clinton is not a universally popular figure in China where she is occasionally subject to sexist rhetoric, but concerning the country that she would adopt a more assertive stance towards Beijing has, have basis in Clinton's past statements about the country. This goes back to the 2008 election. And there was a preference for Obama in Beijing because they were concerned about some of her comments during the race. And I don't think her position as Secretary of State assuaged those concerns. In fact, some may have exacerbated them. She has made clear she thinks differently about America's role in the world stage than President Obama's. She has talked about the downsides of, as of an American absence around the world, saying that bad things tend to happen when America does not lead. In other words, she's a Bushite. She's a Bushite. Obama's a Bushite too, but he's not quite as aggressive a Bushite. And uh, she, Bush, and Clinton, the Clintons and the Bushes and the Obamas, that's quite a trifecta. But uh, the Clintons and the uh, Bushes were quite a pair before the Obamas arrived. But they had to let the Obamas in. And they're in, but they, they had to let them in begrudgingly. So Hillary Clinton, she's pretty hawkish when it comes to she would be a lot more aggressive in the South China Sea maybe than Trump has been at least up to now, up to recently. Uh, but we're going to go on. Familiarity and contempt. Hillary Clinton's 21-year relationship with China. U.S. presidential candidate's high-profile advocacy of human rights has riled leaders in Beijing. There's never been a U.S. presidential candidate better known in China's, uh, to China's 1.3 billion people than Hillary Clinton. Thanks to more than two decades of... Uh, High-profile engagement with the country as First Lady, U.S. Senator, blah, blah, blah. She's really well-known. 
uh, when she announced her expected decision to run, um, whatever, they weren't very happy about it. Okay, so Clinton was viewed favorable by 37% of respondents compared to what just 22% for Trump, according to the survey. Beijing would never make public its preference for a particular U.S. presidential candidate, but the public sentiment might, to some degree, reflect the reader leadership's views. An analyst attributed Chinese animosity towards Clinton to her Iron Lady image, tough stance on China issues over the years and suspicions to Beijing that she was masterminding behind the Arab Spring uprisings. Uh, yeah, she was... Uh, she was the mastermind of what happened in Libya, which I talked about in an earlier video. And uh, that was the I came, we came, we saw he die, where she cackled about murdering uh, Muammar Gaddafi, uh, leader of a sovereign state. Clinton is likely to be tougher towards China than her Republican rival, Trump said Miles Yu, professor of diplomatic history at the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. But analysts also said Chinese leaders might see the merits of a Clinton presidency viewing Trump's unpredictability as riskier than her predictability. That's the same narrative. Same narrative. South China Morning Post. Yeah, South China Morning Post. Remember I read from South Minor China Morning Post earlier? That's this here. U.S.-China relations. Mutual understanding is still possible despite the hostility. Getting, getting a little connection here. here. See, that, that's their narrative. The narrative. Hillary Clinton in the 1990s personally lobbied business to push harder for liberalized trade with China. Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump began their debate tonight by spurring over trade with two exchange ideas about how to prevent jobs from going overseas. Something Trump did not mention was that after Congress failed to pass fast-track powers in 1997 for Bill Clinton's push for permanent normal trade relations with China, the First Lady personally traveled to Davos, Switzerland to complain to business elites at the World Economic Forum that they didn't lobby hard enough. The American business community made a very limited effort on behalf of the fast track, left the field completely clear to the rather unusual alliance between the right of a Republican Party, which is isolationist, anti-American engagement, and quite critical and not supportive of the United Nations, IMF, or any multilateral group, and the left of the Democrat Party that believes that trade authority and trade agreements are not in the interest of American workers, she told them. So that alliance carried the day. Now when the president comes back to the Congress with a request for fast track authority, I hope that American business voices will be hurt. Yeah. So basically, uh, she is saying that uh, she wanted more business and she lobbied very hard for her business because they make tons of money. The world makes tons of money from uh, China as China rises. In 2000, the business elite followed Clinton's advice passing permanent normal trade relations with China. The Economic Policy Institute estimates that 3.2 million jobs were lost between 2001 and 2013 thanks to the growing trade deficit with China. Largest media companies by revenue. That's where we're going to right now. Let's get to this. I want to make a little note here. Down here. And I, uh, I think I'm going to switch scenes here to get this a little bit bigger so you can see this. And the largest 25 newspaper chains own over a third of all newspapers in the U.S. Now that sounds, oh, okay, well, that's bad, but up from one-fifth in 2003. Now, here's the key part. These large chains own two-thirds of all dailies, and in virtually all of the major cities. So they, they control almost all of the ground voices. Just a little note about what the United States has. If, 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 by the way, if you want to influence the United States mass media newspapers, all you have to do is influence 25 people. If you influence 25 CEOs, if you're able to do that, I'm not saying China could do that, or but I'm saying anybody will try to do it. Any, whether it's a foreign power or whatever. Well, foreign powers will all try to do that. So uh, that, that's the circumstance that we find ourselves in right here, just this alone. But we move on. The world's top media companies. Now, of all those top media companies, the, the, the wealthiest newspaper is ranked. I'm going to newspaper company to give a little, little sense of uh, as chart of communications. It's fourth at 124 billion. You see the drop off there from fourth to third. AT&T is 201 billion. Got Comcast there at 210 billion. 
Walt Disney, two hundred twenty-four billion. Billion. Now there's roughly seven hundred and seventy billion dollar uh, uh, U.S. market, and uh, these folks. I don't know what percentage of their is their shares is 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 from the U.S. media market, or if all of this is reflected of just media money alone. But I will tell you that uh, four, three, two, and one uh, collectively that they. They exceed the seven hundred and seventeen million billion dollar uh, U.S. market by themselves. Just these four companies alone. So you get a sense of the massive control that these media companies have over the voices that we see, the culture that we come to believe that we are. It's a small number in this case. If you want to influence these companies, all you need to do is talk to five companies. Really? Five. Charter Communications being one of them. Maybe five companies. Or really just four. I mean, the, the your drop-off from, from Charter Communications to, to CBS. I mean, these are like also rants down here. This is where it's all at, right up here. These four. That's it. The heart and soul of the world is Walt Disney, Comcast, AT&T, and... Charter communications in America. Those are fundamentally all you really need to, uh, to to influence in order for you to have an influence over fundamentally over America's perception of itself. It's pretty chilling. This is all related. And this is uh, Media Entertainment Industry United. Oh, let's move on here. There we go. So you hear, see here, now these figures here, you see, you see, 2019 they go from 5.531 million billion. I'm sorry, in uh, Asia to 7.79 billion. Pretty significant leap. And their their hope and dream and expectation and plan is that this number is going to be skyrocketing through the moon, through the moon, Alice, through the moon, through the moon. And this number over here, it enables them to, well, make a lot less competitive type decisions. Not only do they have a lot less competition, which eliminates their need to worry about serving their customers, but they also are developing and have reason to believe if they can get rid of Donald Trump and he can stop the severing of this China thing and they can reverse it and put things back to the way they were, which is what Joe Biden wants to do. Uh, they could see these numbers massively increase to the point where they, they can really be 100% about making the humans rather than serving the humans. They're already more significantly making rather than serving at this point anyway, and there's good reason for that. They can afford to, and uh, they don't have competition. And in, 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 in no small part, thanks to China, thanks to uh well, basically, uh, increasing reliance on uh, markets outside of the United States. And we go on. Why is Comcast targeting China? This is from 2016. Considering the rising popularity of English language content around the world, U.S. media companies are increasingly focusing on international markets such as China. Comcast considers China a market that will generate a significant profit for the company in the long term. Comcast stated in the company's fiscal 2Q16 earnings call that until about four years ago, the company was making nothing in China, but last year it earned around $170 million in China through movies and television. And that is... That's just uh, Comcast recently. Comcast recently acquired DreamWorks for three point eight billion dollars. DreamWorks is already present in China with Oriental DreamWorks, which produces Chinese animation films. I don't know how much money they're making. The other things that not everything is uh, seen. There's a lot of things that these companies do that uh, I'm well. I won't get into that because this is already going to be long enough. Which it's it's supposed to be this long. Why Millennials and China are key to Comcast DreamWorks deal. This is from March, May 4th, 2016. Comcast acquisition of DreamWorks Animation for about $3.8 billion strengthens the broadcasting and cable TV giant's arsenal as it competes with the Walt Disney Company on several fronts. The acquisition, which is subject to regulatory approvals, got it, of course, enables Comcast to provide stronger content and 
related merchandise to the coveted market of kids, teens, and millennials, and better execute in China strategy, among other games. China, China. So much is relying on being able, not, not just what you're making now, but even more what, what, what could happen in the future. And this is from, this is from January 2018. Collapse of Hawaii deal with AT&T, quote, will threaten China-U.S. trade ties, unquote. After second Chinese investment set back in U.S. in a week, former commerce officials say Beijing should consider countermeasure if situation escalates. The collapse of a deal in which Huawei Technologies was to distribute its smartphones through U.S. carrier AT&T will threaten Sino-U.S. trade ties, and Beijing should consider countermeasures if the situa situation escalates, uh, experts and a former Chinese commerce official said experts. Literally, excerpt, experts, excerpts. This is, remember, this is China, South China Morning Post. Shenhen-based Huawei was due to announce its partnership with AT&T in Las Vegas on Tuesday, but the deal was canceled at the last minute, a major setback for the Chinese company's global expansion. You know why it was set back? You know how many dreams, how many things were in the works other than just this before Trump came along? How many of these deals that Trump killed? You have no idea how pissed off these four companies are at Donald J. Trump and how much money he flushed down the toilet for them. Now, I don't care that he did. I'm glad that he did. These are the four companies that, that, that control 90 plus percent of the, of, the, of the noise that you hear in your head. These are the four companies that make the fundamental decisions about what we hear about what America is and what our culture is. These four companies are are trying to stop Donald J. Trump for one simple reason. He fucked up their China deals. That's it. They don't care about you. They're not moral people. They are willing to do debt de to do business with with a with a country that is literally committing genocide. Even as we speak, that is literally uh, wiping out a whole ethnic people while the world looks on and while American business continues to be in bed with this company, these same American businesses that are now setting forth their HR departments to, to wag their little racism bigotry fingers at us and try to find the racists and bigots and, and basically produce lawsuits for companies and, and destroy their businesses because they'll, they will end up getting rid of all the quality people. And no, I don't mean the white people. I mean the quality people because I guarantee you, white, black, whoever you are, if you're an American at heart, if you understand and live the Bill of Rights principles, and I believe many, certainly intelligent Americans do, uh, it doesn't matter whether you're gay, straight, or black, or white. If you're in one of these companies, you're at risk, and you know it. Because these companies demand, if, if they're, going, they're going to demand what you demand, what Chairman Z demands, conformity. There's only one right way. There's only right one way. They are the way, the truth, and the light. Let no one come to them except through the priest king that they recognized with the authority to declare good and evil. China. Exclusive U.S. lawmakers urge AT&T to cut commercial ties with Hawaii. This is from January 16, 2018. This is before the deal was cut. This is how it happened. U.S. lawmakers are urging AT&T Inc., the number two wireless carrier, to cut commercial ties to Chinese phone maker Hawaii Technologies and oppose plans by telecom operator China Mobile Limited to enter the U.S. market because of national security currents to, to concerns to congressional aides said. The warning comes after the administration of U.S. President Donald Trump took a harder line on policies initiated by his predecessor, Barack Obama, on initiated by his predecessor Barack Obama on issues ranging from Beijing's role in restraining North Korea to Chinese efforts to acquire U.S. strategic industries. Earlier this month, AT&T was forced to scrap a plan to offer its customers Hawaii or handsets after some members of Congress lobbied against the idea with federal regulators. Uh, what do I have this up here? Oh yeah, Charter Communications. Charter Communications. Now, they're the newspaper, but 
Charter Communications doesn't get away scot-free because guess what? Charter Communications has uh, Charter uh, acquired uh, Time Warner Cable. So there, Time Warner Cable was. It doesn't exist anymore. It's been absorbed. That's what it used to look like. It is now Charter Communications. So remember that. AOL Time Warner breaks into China. Hong Kong, China, the parent company of CNN, has signed a deal with the Chinese government that grants its broadcast rights in southern China. Signed a deal with the Chinese government. Charter Communications signed a deal with a, a, a nationalist, an ethnic nationalist socialist state. Signed a deal early on in 2001. This is the first deal of its kind that grants reciprocal rights to both countries. Reciprocal rights to both countries. Miles China in. This is George W. Bush. Senator George Bush. George Bush is the one that allowed this. This is after 9-1-1. So this is after 9-1-1 that this is happening. Remember that. While everybody was looking at uh, them horrible uh, Muslims. Muslims must be them Muslims. Uh, at least one thing I didn't do. I never fell for the Muslim thing. I was, I was, uh, I was, uh, I was against, uh, I was against uh, Saddam Hussein, but never Muslims. I never fell for that one, but a lot of people did. In return, several Time Warner cable systems in America will carry China's state-run English news and press. In other words, they're going to let them have their propaganda. They're going to ah, uh, just that's what they decided in 2001 under George Bush, George Herbert Walker Bush. Uh, this is from Market Realist from 2016. Time Warner increasing focus on China. China's internet penetration rate is rising. According to a January 2016 report from the China Internet Network and Information Center, China had 668 million internet users, an internet penetration of 48.8%. See that? That's what everybody's after. According to the report, Rat Pack and Time Warner's Warner Brothers became investors in the Chinese media fund set by China's state-backed investment group. Time Warner is increasingly focusing on the Chinese market as indicated by the launch of flagship entertainment, a joint venture between Time Warner's Warner Brothers. This is what they were working on. This is, this is, this is before the election, right? Yeah. This is before 2016 election. Donald J. Trump. You go back to this article here. This, uh, which one is it? Is it this one? Not that one. Where it is. No, where are you here? Please be the one. Oh. I can't find the article. This is the article about... Uh, China looking forward to, or basically China favoring Trump or, or, or China favoring Hillary over Trump because uh, basically Hillary would be tougher on China than Trump. Let me tell you what Hillary is. Hillary would be, from the get-go, she would be more hawkish in general. So, so, so the, the the DNC slash Neo GOP, the uh, you call them, uh, I'm going to call them the Neo GOP, the, the Neo RNC, because I don't think that they're as in control of the RNC as they were, although they still, it's still not settled there. But uh, the Neo RNC and the DNC adopted a strategy of a strong military and a liberal policy that allowed Americans to make tons of money over in China and would also enable American businesses to become more and more, whether you want to call it neoliberal or neocon, they're the same things. They're basically using the market. It's a fascistic type. I'm not saying it's fascism, but it's fascistic in that it uses a market to try to, in it's, it's soft coercion 
it is what in China this is what China uses or to the rest of the world China uses this thing called salt it's soft coercion so the idea is to use the markets and you can use them the more the more the markets have the freedom to not compete the more the markets don't rely on you as a necessity and also can can understand that your ability to even leave them is an incredibly difficult decision for you the costly one the more they get into the business of making which is what they wanted to do all along this is one of the reasons why they favor they're they're not saying they want to be ruled by china but uh but there have been now there are there are democrats though that actually do favor a stronger china and a busted america because they view america as being the fundamental cog in seeing socialism emerge throughout the whole world and china being the best chance for that to happen so those Americans exist too, and many of them are high levels of the DNC. And we go on. The next thing. Uh, I think we're just about done here. Warner Brothers expanding to China by Time Warner. This is September 21st, 2015. This is... Let's see, July 13th, 2016, China's Wanda shows interest in Viacom's Paramount sources. China real estate and entertainment conglomerate uh, Dali and Wanda Group has held talks with Viacom Inc. about acquiring a minority stake in its Paramount Pictures unit, according to two people familiar with the situation. Wanda's interest adds new urgency to deliberations over Paramount's future, which has become the flashpoint of a bitter row between Viacom chief person, I'm not going to say the name, it doesn't matter, and the company's controlling shareholder, which brought production company Legendary Entertainment in January, has been trying to expand its U.S. movie business. Redstone has so far opposed the sale, which is not possible without its consent. Other parties behind, besides Wanda have also expressed an interest in Paramount, and there is no certainty any deal will be reached, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, August 14th, 2019, CBS and Viacom to reunite in massive merger. CBS and Viacom, two of the leading entertainment companies in the United States, announced an agreement Tuesday to reunite in a massive all-stock merger after 13 years apart, creating an American media conglomerate valued at about $30 billion U.S. dollars to cope with the increasingly drastic market competition in the country's media industry. Industry. The market value of CBS is currently about $18 billion, and Viacom has a market capitalization of about $12 billion, whatever. Whatever. There you go. There you go. We'll get it there. I think I think that's it. I think we've got it all. Yeah. Gatehouse buys USA Today owner Gannett, creating America's biggest newspaper publisher. Now, one thing I can't tell is why then so many newspapers have gone along with this, and I'm not exactly 100% sure, but uh, at any rate. Newspapers largely controlled by a uh, small number of companies, harder to control, 25 companies. Media, which which drive in many instances drives the newspapers. I would say does drive newspapers and media. Of these uh, major companies that we're looking at, media, they have every they have every reason to loathe what it is that Donald J Trump has done to them he has gutted their fantasies like fishies all of these dreams they were just on the verge of massive expansions in 2016 across the board all kinds of ways and then along comes Donald Trump and they knew right from the start because Donald Trump in 2016 was saying that they needed to redo the trade deals with China. They needed to put everything into question. Even even the most favored nation status which they got in 1990. They had to redo that. China's most favored nation status, congressional consideration, 1989-1998. Congress's willingness to consider disapproving or placing further conditions on China's most favored nation status appears to have declined dramatically since 1992 when Congress came closer to doing both 
than in any prior subsequent year. Long-standing congressional divisions over China policy likewise appear to have deepened crossing party and ideological lines. This report, yeah, provides detailed analysis of congressional legislative action on China's MNF status. Yeah. I'll have the link for you so you can check it out for yourself. Voting on NTR for China again in 2001 and past congressional decisions. Yeah, summary. Since 1990, Congress has faced an annual... Oh, there's the sound. I have to just put the same thing twice. All right. All right. So you get a sense of it all. You get a sense of what it is that we're really talking about. And I tell you, I tell you what we're really talking about. I'll tell you what we're really talking about. Fundamentally. We're talking about that. We're talking about in America, they squawk over racisms and bigotries, first world problems, I can assure you. While over in uh, China, they're in the business of genociding the Uyghurs. And uh, you have, uh, and I do know I spelled Uyghur wrong, I missed the Y there. Correct that here while I speak here. So, so yeah, at any rate. Uh, while they're doing this, um, our, our top four mega media companies that control 90 plus percent of the noise in your head and make the, the, all of the, the cultural gatekeeping decisions that have been made so rigidly and dramatically over the last 10 years, they're wholly and completely in bed with the Chinese state. This is a, this is a a fascio socialist state that is Han Chinese race supremacist centered and is seeking to eradicate an ethnic group so that they can spread the Han Chinese into those lands and they can absorb the Uyghurs. These people are our moral our moral guides. These people are the ones that have been canceling and destroying humans' lives because it's the support of these mega corporations. It's the work of these mega corporations that have killed so many human beings metaphorically and otherwise across these lands in the name of enforcing something that really is designed to do one thing, completely invalidate Donald Trump and get rid of him as fast as you can to stop the China separation, to stop the China decoupling because they stand to lose trillions of dollars trillions of dollars long term trillions and they stand to lose tremendous ability to continue to be makers of humans rather than servants of humans and with that I, I will tell you I bid you adieu I knew this was going to be a long one and now two long ones in a row this was even longer than the last one but this one there's another one of these shows. Both of these shows in a row were two ones that I've been thinking about doing for a while. And so I said, hey, let's just let's just get them both done now. And with that I say, have a great rest of your day.